I'm Emily Galagoski with Women 2.0's In Conversation series, here with Sukinder Singh Cassidy of Polyvore.com. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you. No problem. So I'm eager to hear a little bit about your road from executive to entrepreneur and mm-hmm. sort of what that's what that's entailed for you. Sure. So um, to put it in perspective, it started as entrepreneur, executive, back to entrepreneur. Um, and I think at my heart, um, I'm just somebody who loves to build and grow things. So uh, I came to the Valley, gosh, I guess almost 12 years ago and ended up at the first web shopping company, a company called Jungly. Uh, doing business development. Uh, they then got acquired by Amazon uh, and then became a founder of my uh, my own company, Yodley, which is still going. It's a, a leader in financial services software where I ran biz dev and sales and a bunch of other functions at various points in time as a founder does um, as the company grows. Um, I went to Google after Yodley and there actually I incubated and built a, a number of businesses, but it was still the same thing. It was all about growing small teams. And at Google, of course, the wonderful opportunity of scaling those businesses beyond what you'd ever think was possible. Um, so I helped build the local and print and video teams, and then I went on to set up Asia, Pacific, and Latin America for us. So China to Brazil. And have there been sort of any parallels or lessons learned in working in international business that have applied to working in a startup? Well, you know, it's interesting because lots of people presume that at a big company, the thesis is that you have lots of resources. And if anything, I was running 18 different startups at the same time because Google actually believes in the small team philosophy. So people would be surprised that China or Brazil or Australia or India started with less than 10 people. Um, And you needed to prove your success with those 10 and actually show the ROI of that investment and add headcount. So in many ways, it was the same thing. It was fighting for resources, um, but staying very lean Um, and getting a lot done with a lot of constraints. So I think it was very similar, actually. I felt like, as I said, I was running 18 different startups at the same time. And what really got you excited after Excel Partners um, to to get on board with Polyvore and to run that chip? Well, I think, first of all, I think when I exited Google, it was very clear to me that I wanted to go back to building. It's sure. really the stage I love the most. And I spent a year at Excel. And my specific thesis when I was at Excel as a CEO in residence was I thought that there was a very open space in commerce, and specifically commerce for soft goods. You know, it's just not done well online to shop for clothing or home items or anything that really has a subjective perspective. Um, I added to that really sort of my personal passion is to go build a women's consumer brand. Um, And when I spent a year looking at the space, there was just one company that stood out to me as having a really incredibly differentiated platform, and that was Polyvore. Um, And as as things always will, I met the founder of Polyvore over two years ago when I was still at Google. So um, Polyvore wasn't new to me. I just kept getting drawn back to the company. And what do those initial conversations sound like Mm -hmm. with someone who's founded a company, or in Mm -hmm. their case, you know, a small Mm -hmm. management team, when they're looking to bring on an experienced CEO, Mm -hmm. what kind of questions are they asking of you? Well, it's really interesting. You know, first and foremost, I think one of the highest risk hires for any founder is a CEO. Of course. Um, And I remember that feeling at Yodely, right? Because it is your baby and you're invested in it. Uh, And probably the thing I am, that was most interesting to me about, about the uh, process with Polyvore is by the time I took the CEO job at Polyvore, I had known the founder for two years. We had a coffee date probably every four months talking about where the business should go. So before I ever knew I wanted to be CEO, I loved the business enough and we had a personal connection that we would just meet and I actually wanted to help him, whether I was a CEO or not. I had a true passion for the business and we had a connection. And so I guess my single piece of advice is people often think that you can make these critical hiring decisions on a single interview, even a CEO or two or three. And really, can you tell if some Somebody's going to fit after knowing them for a day, <laughs> you know, or for after an hour. So I think the thing I found most instructive about the Polyvore experience is I would say, after spending that much time with the founder, when the actual formal opportunity to become the CEO came up, I felt like I was very aware of, uh, of maybe what the first 100 days of the company would look like. And to me, that's the most important thing, is you're thinking about joining a company, whether you're the CEO or whether you're someone else, like, invest the time, you know, and, and as long as that process takes, you should be able to imagine, actually, what your first 100 days on the job looks, looks like, as opposed to interviewing quickly, accepting the job, and day one, what you do is completely different than what you expected, right? So take the time to get educated, and um, this is a really important decision. So that said, what is the hiring process like at Polyvore? And, and you know, if it's not one conversation, what is what do you look for? Well, you know, I think it's something that that is still evolving for us for the same reason, because I think we all... 
I think we all sit around and think about what are the predictors of success of somebody who will be a great fit for our company. And unfortunately, a lot of those are hard to gauge in an interview. Sure. Um, sure. And so I would say that we're not perfect. We're figuring it out. Who is the strong yes and the champion for anybody coming in, right? Um, because I fundamentally believe that you need a strong yes. A lot of people believe in sort of consensus hiring. Consensus hiring to me is sort of a surrogate for everybody is okay with a candidate. I'm not looking for everybody to be okay with me. I want to know that there's a champion and that champion is either somebody who's worked with them before or somebody who's trusted in the organization who's willing to say like I believe strongly this candidate is a yes um, and, and I think you need somebody who's willing to go to bat for every candidate. Right. So um, I think a lot of people confuse great hiring with consensus hiring. I'm not sure. I think often the greatest candidates may stir the most debate. Interesting. Now, at the um, at Astia's We Own It Summit mm -hmm. this earlier mm -hmm. this year, you mentioned your view that Silicon Valley is not necessarily sexist, mm -hmm. but it might be ageist. <laughs> and I'm interested to ask you a bit more about sure. that idea. Sure. So I think, you know, it's interesting that there is always this debate about whether or not there are enough women in leadership positions in the Silicon Valley or outside of it. And I think... I certainly have a thesis and, as I've said, a personal passion for wanting to see women um, be empowered and Polyvore is itself an expression of female empowerment, right. I think, in many ways, and letting women express themselves. But I actually think it's quite okay to not make the choice to be in a leadership position, male or female, for whatever reason. If you, know, if you have different priorities in your life, you know, leadership positions require a lot of personal sacrifice and there are no bad choices. So, first of all, I think everybody judges that a woman has to want that and I'm, I'm not you know, that's not my thesis. It's okay to want it or not want it. If you want it, you know, I would love to be, you know, somebody who help, can help enable that for men or women. But when you step back, really, I think the valley is much less about whether you're a woman or man, because I do believe it's a meritocracy. It's about whether you have enough energy for the task, right? Starting a company is hard, right? It is lonely. <laughs> you know, you are the sole evangelist when you're the founder. Right? You don't know about the, uh, the outcomes for success. It is 24-7. So I think of it as an unencumbered person's game, game in the sense that, you know, I'm now a mother of three, right? Come hell or high water, right, is important for me to see my children before they go to sleep. That often means after they go to sleep, I'm back on email, right? But I am no longer what I was when I was 27 when I'm able to sit at my desk all night till 2 a.m. I'm still up, to, at, up at 2 a.m., but there are, you know, there are things, there are other commitments I have in my life. So I guess my point is not that it's not doable with somebody who's older, um, but I do think that it takes just a sheer amount of energy. So young or old, male or female, you better have enough energy for the task and energy to sustain you. How old were you when you recognized that you were one of those energetic people? Oh gosh, I mean, I'm sure people would say I was the energy, you know, sort of the energy bunny from, from birth. I mean, I'm just, you know, I've just always been one of those people who has a lot of, just a lot of ability to sort of have and sustain energy, so. What was your first job? Sales. Uh, my first job, well actually I take that back, I step one, one back. My first job was as a receptionist in my father's medical practice because he instilled in me from sort of day one that you wanted to be your own boss and he ran his medical practice like a business. And then my first real job, i.e. not employed by my parents, was doing sales for a hotel. Uh, when you sort of put your sales hat on mm -hmm. for organizations that you've run, is that something that's a particular passion mm -hmm. or is that a piece of the business you maybe would rather have another team focus on? Oh, well, I, I mean, you know, gosh, every, I'm sure every leader has lots of theses and I have sure. no shortage of my own. I guess I fundamentally believe that while you can stay, you can try and be a generalist when you start your career. At some point, people rise because of specific expertise, because they are the master of their craft. I fundamentally believe that, right? And early on, I became good at sales and business development, and I mastered that craft, right? And that's what allowed me to successively, you know, get jobs of increasing responsibility. So for me, actually, I love sales and business development. I love sort of any external facing task, PR, you know, I get energy off other people. So maybe I'm well suited to that. But I think the, the more important lesson to take away from it is, you know, for you to ask yourself, if you're somebody who's aspiring to be a CEO or what have you, what is your craft? And a lot of people think the path to being a CEO is about being a generalist. I disagree. I think it's about picking a discipline and doing it extraordinarily well and becoming the master of your craft. And at some point, you will have that opportunity. I love that advice. Well, thank you so much. Okay.